Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today. Welcome to the Primary Loop. I'm Jim Anderton, Multimedia Content Director here at Engineering.com. You know, additive manufacturing has evolved from a classroom curiosity into a repeatable and reliable method for mass production part making. Traditional constraints like material availability, speed and resolution, as well as cost, well, they've been largely addressed in many applications such as aerospace. It's viable and cost effective, but what will it take to move this technology into the forefront ahead of traditional subtractive technologies like CNC machining? Joining me to discuss these interesting possibilities are Dr. Ankit Sairan, Senior Manager for Metals Technology at EOS. Ankit, welcome to The Loop. Absolutely, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, Ankit, it's, we've, we've watched additive move literally from something that, that teenagers use in their basements and they're in the back of classrooms where we're essentially extruding, you know, uh, like a glue gun, extruding thermoplastics out of a hot nozzle into something now which is a go-to technology for uh, gas turbine components for Pete's sake, for, you know, safety critical and, and high performance stuff. Uh, it's the perception has always been that it's it's neat and it's interesting, but it's really expensive and it's really slow. Is is that still the case these days for metals? I think additive manufacturing has come a long way since the early, I would say, last decade or even the decade before. And I think over time, uh, what we felt is that there's increased amount of confidence, and now people are now the industry as a whole instead of saying that. You have to do all these tests to prove me the technology is repeatable and reliable. Now people are looking at ways of optimizing it. How can we bring the cost down? We know that the technology can produce. We know we can use this in production. We can know it can add value with respect to traditional manufacturing, whether it's in terms of uh, getting more functional designs in place, saving weight, or reducing, uh, reducing wastage. From a cost effectiveness perspective, it's, it's, it is a go-to technology nowadays. I'm curious about the, the way engineers, design engineers think. Uh, uh, mechanical engineers in particular, are they're historically trained to think in Cartesian ways. You know, it's a war and trust. It's a triangle of forces. It's always about sort of, of resolving vectors, you know, in, into an X, Y, and sort of, sort of Z coordinates. Is there a challenge for design engineers to stop thinking about, you know, right angles to, to make this technology work? I think it's always a challenge, and I think, in my opinion, design engineers are more capable than we industry lets them be. I think they're only thinking in right angles because they've been told to think in right angles. If you actually let the constraint free, I think no design engineer would like to design in right angles. They would like to get their hands free. So I think that's what the technology is enabling in many cases, of course, with uh, with caution that you know, uh, many years ago, or I think in some cases, the slogan was complexity is free with additive. Well, nothing, there's no free lunches in the world. You know? <laughs> Not, nothing's free, everything has a cost to it. And I think uh, design engineers are now realizing that what they can do with additive, how can they change their thinking in terms of removing material, now I'm adding material, and I'm adding material where I want to add material, thereby optimizing my design to a point where now I think uh, people are looking at topology optimization and more organic shapes like you were alluding to earlier, where people are letting algorithms run a topology optimization algorithm to, you know, uh, same weight, take weight out, take structure out of places where it's not needed and beef up at places where it's needed. And I think that's always the interesting case uh, to where it's evolved even right now that instead of like asking a human to provide a feedback, now we have AI algorithms coming in with a few companies, uh, Hyperganic, Leap71, there are others, where you can do more what they call parametric modeling, where you're not doing a traditional CAD software by drawing up a line, like X, like you said, in the Cartesian coordinates, right? Define X, Y, and Z, and then define another coordinate to draw up a circle or a square and kind of model from there. Um, they're kind of thinking of how you can program the CAD. So think about like you created a whole nozzle and now you want to change that nozzle thickness from five millimeters to one millimeters. And now on to add to the complexity to make it fun, that nozzle is tapered. So it's going to take a long time for a design engineer to do this manually. But I think what's coming on right now with these algorithms is and parameter modeling is that you can just change one line of code and it's going to change the entire model for you in seconds. 
And I yep. think uh, that's the future, which probably we actually don't get to. Yep. Uh, it's, I've seen some applications where, um, I'm going to take a simple example, a, um, a cylindrical column multiple applications, very common thing. Um, uh, you might conceptually start off with a, a solid billet. To reduce the weight, now it's a tube. Uh, then the tube, it's a question then of the wall thickness of the tube versus the overall diameter of the part. If I want a thinner wall section, I have to have a larger diameter. That may have knock-on effects in a design you know, someplace else. You're, you work in a world where it's possible to simply say, well, let's put some internal structure inside the cavity of the tube, completely enclosed space, which can, actually can't be accessed, and perhaps have the best of both worlds. It's a totally new way of thinking, and I have to give you that, that in a way, like, like you said, you know, in the cylindrical column, and I'll give you another example is basically thrust chambers or uh, nozzle that are actually printed by many different space companies. There's a concept of regenerative cooling, which is not which is not very new. Essentially, what it is that you are cooling your uh, the the chamber walls uh, by drilling holes straight through, uh, because the temperature inside those chambers of the rockets is actually sometimes orders of degrees, orders of magnitude more than the melting point of the chambers themselves. So you have to cool them down uh, uh, somehow. And regenerative cooling is, like I said, it's not a new concept. It was just a straight drill through holes because that's how you can do traditionally. And uh, it gave a fantastic performance. It was hailed as a new technology to a point where now they're said like, okay, instead of going through straight, what if I actually curve around the whole jacket, give me better cooling performance. And on top of that, instead of putting a coolant inside, you know what, I'm actually going to put fuel through its set. The fuel is going to actually take up the heat, get to an appropriate temperature, what I think what they call conditioning of the fuel before they put in the mixture, gets the right temperature and gives you the maximum performance and thrust. I think those are the type of concepts that uh, that this technology is enabling. I can, what I'm hearing is, especially from the heat transfer community, is that this is a technology which is going to revolutionize the heat exchanger as as we know it at this point. We know we've all seen the we all learned in in school, you know, the basic fin and tube sort of of textbook empirically driven solutions. We know the formulas basically, so we can design something which will get the heat flow rates that we want. But you're talking about a world where the level of complexity could be managed almost to a microscopic level. And that has effects, you know, for the viscosity of the coolant, its wettability. There are multiple factors at play here. Are we looking at a future where it, to make an efficient heat exchanger, you just have to 3D print it, additive it? Like if you're doing more simplistic design and large designs, yes, you can go for directed energy depositions. But if you're going for com complicated cooling channels or from a heat exchanger, or you have gyroid structures or thin walls or anything, now you're primarily looking at laser powder bed fusion. And when we come to a laser powder bed fusion, one of the main constraints comes very quickly when it comes to the heat exchanger is the size. Like how tall of a heat exchanger can I build? Like that's that's one, one thing that we're running into right now, but even without the constraints of the size, I don't think that additive would ever replace con conventional manufacturing completely. I think it can improve, it can complement, it would include the number of use cases that it can deploy this technology to. But uh, just to give you an example, in one case is we're talking about coal plates. Like these coal plates are put in the data centers to you know cool them down because whatever we're doing right now, people doing Amazon Web Services, doing Facebook, all that data needs to be stored somewhere. And that data is stored in data centers run by these huge companies. And that generates massive amounts of heat and you need to be able to cool those data centers down. So the next revolution that we were working with some companies there were, how about if we can actually deploy some these revolutionary designs where we can do 100 micron wall thicknesses of copper, pure copper, which to think about it, 100 micron, that's less than the thickness of human hair. Like conventionally, I don't know how you make it, but these are the designs we're exploring right now because then it shoots the efficiency of your cooling through the roof. Because instead of packing in so many coal plates, now I can come make it more efficient, reduce the amount of components I have to run and reduce the amount of even wastage in terms of your like carbon footprint of these heat uh, cooling towers. Okay, we could talk about this forever. It's just, there's, it's so deep, it's so broad, this subject. Last question is that, will we reach a point and can you foresee a point in which the primary mass production part making technology is additive and what we think of as five axis machining now becomes strictly a supportive or, or secondary production technology? I think we're already seeing that in some cases. Uh, I'm not saying there are a huge amount of applications that way. 
And the, we're seeing that in some cases, but if you keep that in mind, there are very few applications in production with respect to additive that are designed for this process. 95% of the time when we're looking at production or when we see customers come to us like, hey, we'd like to get this in production, we're looking at legacy applications already serve a purpose. And we're trying to somehow make them fit into the additive box. Sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't. And sometimes you have to make changes, chisel here and there to make them fit inside the additive box. We start designing applications or parts that are made for this process. For example, the regenerative cooling cluster, like I told you about. Brilliant. I, I, it's an incredible future. I can't wait to see where this technology is going to take us. Ankit Saran, EOS, thanks for joining me on The Primary Loop. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that's it for this episode of The Primary Loop, brought to you by Engineering.com. For our deeper engineering series, visit Engineering.com TV for exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, Designing the Future, and The Engineering Roundtable, not found here on our YouTube channel. The links are in the description below. Thanks for watching.